to a brother like you. Amen. To push somebody out. Turn with me to Mark 8, 27 and 38. They ain't got nothing to do, I'm going to start my clock. They ain't got nothing to do with what we're talking about this morning, except for the fact that um, I understand that as Christians we know the truth. There are things that we go through from time to time where we need some good reminders. This is not a passage I don't think that um, if you've been in church for any amount of time you would be unfamiliar with. But there may be some reminders here that will be um, so, and there may, there, may, there may be some revelation here that is that is helpful to all of us. Mark uh, 8, 27, 38. Say, I got it when you got it. I got it. And if at the end of this message, if you want to end the aisle with somebody who feel like they need to answer all of them, <laughs> well, you just push them out there. Just push them out there. <laughs> Verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the village around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Amen. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about me. Verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him to the side and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world? Yet forfeit his soul. My Lord, my God. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Amen. My focus this morning is verse 34. What a passage, what a scene. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Amen. You may have read this passage, read that sentence, you may have heard this preached. I've heard it for quite some time, but I'm here to tell you this morning, I've read it over and over again. I've heard it, I even heard it talked about, but I don't know if I know it exactly. I don't know if I knew what it means. I had to do some research. I really had to try to understand what does it mean to deny yourself? And what does it mean to take up your cross? Another uh, one of the gospels says, "Take up your cross daily and follow me." What is Jesus actually saying? When you think about this, it actually can be kind of confusing. Jesus, are you saying I need to deny who I am as a person? Do I need to deny my personality or my proclivities, my tendencies, my 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 makeup? Do I need to deny who you made me to be? Do I need to deny myself? My what, what are you talking about? Do I need to deny? Is it habits? Is this about just you know not eating as much chocolate? What is this talking about? Deny myself. Take up my cross. I thought you were the one who was going to the cross. Why do I gotta take the cross up? What do you mean take up cross up? First of all, this sounds kind of hard. Denying myself sounds like it's one thing, but then taking up a cross, you mean I got, I got to take up a cross? I thought you were the one who going to the cross. Now, I got to have a cross. I got to take it somewhere. Where do I got to take it? What do I do with it? What do I do with it? What is this all about? Now, you've been telling people to follow you 
For, for most of the gospels, follow me, leave, 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 leave your job, follow me, follow me, follow me. He turned, Jesus turned everybody and said, follow me. What does it actually mean? If you were to think about it and just read it, you don't have to be a biblical scholar, it means what it says. It means deny yourself. It means you are sinful, you got to deny the part of yourself that is sinful. It means carry a cross. Yes, there is some crosses in life you have to, um, you have to pick up. And it means you got to follow him. It's actually pretty simple when you think about it. I looked at, um, I, I looked at um, um, John Piper, for example, says, denying yourself and taking up your cross involves at least four things. He says, in one, at least it involves facing opposition. So what you want to be is accepted. You want to be accepted. You don't want people telling you that Christianity is foolishness. So you want to be accepted. So you might deny Christianity save your own life, not be willing to lose it, and not face that opposition. And so he says, sometimes there's official opposition that you want to face. So denying yourself means to confront that opposition. He says it means shame. The cross was an instrument of shame, Piper says. It wasn't, it wasn't just about the torture, but it was about the shame. So Christianity is a life where you, where you face the shame of living the life that God lived on earth for a later reward that you may never see. Hebrews, text Hebrews 11, they went around um, uh, and, and they did not receive the things that were promised. And you, you go down that litany of the, the people who were in a cloud of witnesses and they, they, were, they were tortured and they were burned in the stake. You, 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 you not only have opposition and shame, but there is suffering and ultimately there is death. Whether that is spiritual death or literal death that people have given their lives. Given their lives for the sake of the gospel. And John Piper says, you understand this passage by looking after what he says when he says, uh, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. If you want to be my disciple is one of the most important sentences, he says, in the entire Bible for those who want to be believers. This is what you have to do if you're going to be saved. It's not just fire insurance, but you have to live a life of sacrifice and pain and suffering and carrying a cross and maybe even death. I said, ouch, Lord have mercy. This stuff is serious. And I started to think to myself, okay, that's what it means. But, I looked at John Piper. I looked at another minister who said the exact same thing as John Piper. I looked all over YouTube. I looked at some commentaries. And I, and I looked at explanations in, 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 in different uh, um, devotionals online. And I, and I looked in, in, in Gill's commentary and, and Matthew Henry's commentary and all. I did, I, the more I read, the more I got confused because what I saw was an explanation of what it means to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. But I didn't see anybody tell me how to do it. How do you deny yourself? Now it's going to get tight up in here. I know it's going to get tight and sorry. It's going to get tight because it got tight on me. I know me. I know Christian folk. I know the world. The most difficult thing anybody can ever do is deny themselves. And whether Carrying your, uh, picking up your cross, it doesn't actually say carry your cross, it says take up your cross. Whether that means you're going to face suffering, or whether that means you're going to face difficulty or opposition, or shame, or pain, or death, it's hard to do it. There's some hard stuff, and I don't, I have to admit to you, I'm interested in ease, and I'm going to be comfortable. I'm, I'm not interested in sacrificing my life for the sake of the gospel. I'm sorry, I just said no to my <laughs> I've noticed that I know God forgave me. I know I don't have to, because uh, Romans 8, 1 said there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who are uh, in Christ Jesus, the power of the, uh, the, the, the Spirit gives life. But I've noticed that there are times when I feel condemned. When I feel like, God, how can you feel far away? 
I've noticed I've got things in my life that I keep doing over and over and over and over. I've been saved for about 20 some odd years, probably right after that party, and then that's something more. <laughs> Whatever that was. But I did thank God. But I noticed that I've been doing the same thing since back then, and it keeps repeating. And some of my messages keep coming up with the same stuff because God keeps hitting me with the same stuff because I be doing some of the same stuff. Now, I know I'm not alone. Some of us in here been saved. We look at some of the seasoned saints. I'm not trying to talk about my seasoned saints. I'm not, y'all, 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 I mean, y'all, 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 y'all are seasoned saints. <laughs> but just because you get to be 65, or, oh, no, I'm sorry, just because you get to be 60, or 65, Pastor No, or 65, or, or 70, don't mean you don't need the Holy Spirit. Some of us have been dealing with some of the same stuff, and matter of fact, y'all know better. So some of us have been dealing with the same stuff for like 30 or 40 years. My God, my God. And you still need God to speak to you on a day-to-day basis about that thing. Now, how do you deny yourself? How do you take up your cross and carry it every sin? How do you follow Jesus all the way to do what he says to do? How do you get to a point where at the end of your life, you can hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant, and you can meet him without any shame, without any remorse. You know that you belong to him. How do you get there? That's what I want to know. Because the reality is, There are a lot of us, I'll say it like this, because this is how I thought about it. If y'all saw me when I wasn't here, when I'm by myself, or when I'm with some other folk, or when I'm at home, y'all would not think I look as good as I do today. It, and then I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go even deeper. I'm going up. I'm just going. I'm not gonna just put it out there. If y'all knew what I thought about. Oh my yes. God. If y'all knew my thoughts, if y'all knew my fantasies, if y'all knew what I, if y'all knew where my head goes, if y'all knew what I really wanted, y'all would actually try to put me out of church. And I know I'm not alone. The one thing I have learned to do in these 20 some odd years is look at myself and say, you got to be honest with yourself. Now hear this one, this is all my introduction. How many people in this building, well, have you been with him for, uh, Jesus, uh, 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 as a Christian, uh, uh, saved or walking with him, filled with the Holy Spirit? How many have you been walking with him a year, six months, three months, two days, 25 years, 35 years? How many people know you need the God to help you deny some area of yourself? Some of our marriages, some of the stuff on our jobs, some of the stuff that, that, that's in our relationships. Every single body in the building has a little area that they need God to work with them in. It's your thing. It's your. It's, it's a thing that you need, and it's different for everybody. I'm preaching the gospel. This I'm preaching evangelism this morning to Christians. And I find something in this passage, fortunately. Um, John Piper leads us to, the, the, to, to what comes after Jesus saying, um, uh, then he called the crowd to him and with his disciples, and he said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And, and after that, um, most of the people who, who deal with this passage, they say, well, the explanation is that you really don't want to lose your life. So here's how you save it. You save it by denying yourself and picking up your cross. Well, that's not helpful for me. Because I find that I would be willing to risk my eternal destiny for something that I might want to get right now. And I've been walking with him for 20 some odd years. And it's only by God's grace that I'm even able to say I'm still in him right now. So for me, I, I really appreciate what, what, what they had to say, but I couldn't use it. It, 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 it wasn't helpful to me. I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't talk about it. What actually helped me was what came before. When, when you really actually open it up, it's really beautiful. Look at verse, um, 
the diverse, uh, the, um, that's the diverse company. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to speak about three things. Um, and I tried to make it so that it, it might be a little uh, memorable. Three things I see in the entire passage. One, you need to re examine yourself. Re examine yourself. If you want to deny yourself, if you want to deny yourself and pick up your cross and take up your cross and follow him, you need to re examine yourself. You need to re examine yourself. Second, you need to renounce your self. Re-examine, renounce, and thirdly, you need to remind yourself constantly of what Jesus has done. Re-examine yourself, renounce yourself, and remind yourself. And I find it in this passage. Look at, um, look at verse 29. Look at verse 29. Jesus asked him, what about you? He said to his disciples. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you're the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Then he goes on right after that verse 31 to talk about his death. He said he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him to the side and began to rebuke him. This is actually where I see how you get it done. Jesus said, I am going to die a criminal's death on the cross. Peter takes him to the side. Now you gotta imagine this scene. You gotta use your Holy Ghost for imagination to picture this scene. Jesus laying it down to him. This is what's gonna happen. This is what the scriptures say, right? About the You just admitted that I'm the Messiah. Oh, here's what's gonna happen to the Messiah. And Peter pulls him to the side. Jesus, come on, Jesus. Hold on, Jesus. Hold on, Jesus. Luke 9 actually tells us, and Matthew 16 tells us what he said. Peter took him to the side, says Luke 9, 22, and began to rebuke him. Now you know what a rebuke is. A rebuke is when you when you chide somebody. You you get in their face. And, 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 and Peter said to him, far be it from you, Luke 9. He said, that this should ever happen to you, exclamation point. Matthew 16 makes it even more fact. Peter took him to the side and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, never. This shall never happen to you. Y'all get the scene? Jesus just told him, I'm going to die for, for, um, uh, uh, for the sins of mankind. And Peter's like, no, it's not going to happen. No, we ain't doing that. No, it's not going to happen. It ain't happening. Now, why would Peter rebuke Jesus for telling him that he's going to die as the Messiah after Peter just actually admitted? Admitted because he was the one. He was the one who said, you're the Messiah. Now, why would he say, no, you ain't going to die? No, no, it's not going to die. And, and, and I thought, and I thought, and I thought, let's just kind of say for a second. Why do you think, why do you think, why do you think Peter would rebuke him? Why do you think Peter would be like, no, Jesus, you ain't going to die? No, I, no, he ain't going to die. He loved them. That's that, okay. He loved them. He didn't want to see them go through that pain. He didn't want to die. He didn't believe them. Maybe. What else? Any other thoughts? He didn't want to be without them. He won't be without them. Jesus is. You know, he's been doing miracles and he's been he's been dependent. You know, on Jesus. Maybe. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I, the, the, the commentator I looked at Gil um, gives us two explanations. One is along the lines of some of the things y'all just said. That Peter was concerned about Jesus. Um, that Peter did not want Jesus to suffer. Uh, you know, Peter was not, um, you know, um, Peter understood, as any Jew would in the first century, who the Messiah was. The Messiah, in fact, was a coming, a prophesied coming ruler. And so, Peter at least understood that the Messiah, um, and it actually means in Hebrew, means the one who was anointed. The, the promised descendant of King David, who would bring the Jewish people um, uh, back again from where, kind of the, the, the lowest state where they were, and he would bring them back up and, and have them rise in society, overthrow the Romans. And they would set up a global kingdom. This is what the Messiah was prophesied to do. And throughout the Old Testament, uh, he was uh, uh, prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem, check. Born of, Messiah, born of a virgin, check. That the Messiah would suffer and die for sin, and that the Messiah would die before the second temple was destroyed. That's getting a little complicated, but the point is this. It's, Jesus is, is saying, listen, the Son of Man is going to do all these things. And Jesus says, no, it's not going to happen. Why? 
Peter, a Jew, was looking forward to Jesus setting up a new kingdom on earth. Peter had left his little job as a fisherman. And he followed Jesus all around these little towns. And Peter thought he was going to be important. He thought he was going to be significant. He thought he'd be sitting right next to Jesus in the new, in the new global reigning kingdom. And, and, and the, the Israel's promise would start right back then and there. The reason that Jews today do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah because they believe he got crucified and he never fulfilled the prophecy. That Jesus would set up a kingdom on earth. Peter was looking for that kingdom on earth. Peter is kind of like some of us. What's most important to Peter is Peter. Peter did not care if Jesus died the death of a martyr or death on a cross or got crucified, got all his hands chopped off. It doesn't matter. It'd be like me saying, and I thought about this, it, like me saying, well, you know what? Um, they, um, if my wife came and told me, sweetie, you know, I think I'm, I think I'm going to die the death of a martyr. I think I am going to go and I, I just said, the guy just tell me I'm just going to die. And I'd be like, who won't pay the mortgage? <laughs> right? Peter is thinking about Peter. <laughs> How are we gonna make it real, man? Peter is thinking about Peter's prominence, his importance, his significance. Peter's thinking about him. The flesh in all of us thinks about its own interests. Peter's little area as an insignificant fisherman was that now he was going to be great in the kingdom and he was going to be somebody and he was going to do and so he said no that's not going to happen to you because if you die the death of a loser on a cross I'm the follower of a loser and I can't have that so Peter was interested in his own significance his own prominence and he was willing though he was saying I'm going to follow you Jesus what was he really following for the crowd that Jesus was speaking to was not interested in any prophecies and what Jesus would do for mankind or the, 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 the Jewish nation. They were interested in getting fed. That's why they followed. So I say, the first thing I'm going to do if I need to deny, my, if I'm going to deny myself is I have to look at myself. Self, what are you really following Jesus yes. for? Yes. Why? Are you trying to be so saved because it makes you feel so good? Is your righteousness saving you? Are you your own savior? Peter was becoming his own functional savior. He didn't need Jesus to be, if, if, if Jesus could have been anybody. Jesus wanted to get to the end goal of his self-importance, just like so many of us, and, and this doesn't necessarily apply to each of us, but there's an area in us I say, I have to challenge myself to think of in myself, yes. self, what's more important to you than God? Yes. Is there anything, um, Tim Keller, a preacher I listen to a lot, asked two questions. He said, listen, what do you, when do you get angry? You can, you can check yourself out where I ask when you get angry. When you, when you blow, when you really blow up, when somebody really threatens your security, you blow up at them or blow up at a situation or blow up in a situation or make a mistake and do something that you regret later because you're definitely afraid of losing something that might start off being a good thing, but you don't want to lose it because it's more important to you than it is to God. Where in my life as a Christian is there something that I actually worship and idolize more than God? It's at the root of every addiction. It's at the root of discrimination. It's at the root of prejudice. It's at the root of murder. It's at the root of selfishness. It's at the root of embezzlement. It's at the root of every single thing, saying, well, a white collar, blue collar you can think of. It's at the root of when you uh, this, uh, leave somebody out and you make yourself important. It's at the root of when you take the selfies and put them online and then everybody's worshiping you. And there's a, there's a few of them right there because, and, and there's nothing wrong with the internet, there's nothing wrong with selfies. Please don't believe that. But, but what happens when you get a taste? of folk worshiping you. And folks saying to you, you are beautiful. You are handsome. At 
the root of every addiction is children in the room. I can't say the thing that I'm thinking about right now, but those things that hit men at the root of it is not what the other sex does or how the other sex looks or how they're attractive. No, that's not it. It's self. I want to be worshipped. I want to be the man. I want to be strong. I want to be it. I want to be somebody. What would you do? Where in your life, and this is offensive, I'm going to get off this in a second, but it's important. It's offensive to the people who believe in social justice. To think that instead of checking those who would oppress the oppressed, we need to check ourselves. Jesus did not come to lead a revolution against the Roman oppressors. He came to lead a revolution from within. So a revolution is about love from within. He said, forget the Romans. Let me tell you like this. Forget the uh, people of the opposite persuasion for a moment. Yeah. What are you doing? A uh, Paolo Freire, uh, a, a, a Catholic um, a teacher, theologian uh, from 50 years ago said, listen, when we overcome our oppression, what happens when we actually get power? We become the oppressor. Uh -huh. So if you really want the American dream, and that's what you want out of life, and that's your God, then guess what? You're no different than somebody who would fire somebody, or, or, or downsize your company, or not pay somebody, or sexually abuse somebody. You're no different because you want the same thing. And Jesus would say, if you want it on the inside and you ain't even do it, you still did it. Yes, this thing is tight. Yes. 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 Deny yourself. Self. Self. Deny yourself that self is a beast Jesus looked at the disciples and he said y'all don't understand what you're dealing with what you are dealing with is not Roman oppression you don't need that freedom you need freedom from yourself because yourself will destroy you your greed will destroy you rich or poor it will destroy you from the inside Your lack of self-esteem becomes so self-focused that it becomes self-pity and you're focusing on yourself and now yourself is so selfish that in every situation it's all about you, how it affects you. Think about the people we know for a second. How many people deal with somebody in their life and it's all about them? Yes. That makes sense. Amen. Amen. Peter said, Jesus, no, you're not going to the cross. Because he was thinking about the things that he was interested in. And Jesus said, interestingly, he, in some of the, a couple of gospels, he says, in, in, in one of the gospels, he says, he said to Peter. Then the other gospels, it actually says, he turned to his disciples and to the crowd. And I use Mark because that's what it says in Mark. It turns to every, Jesus is speaking off the page. He's lifting up his eyes off the page to everybody, and he's saying, guess what? Get thee behind me. What was Satan interested in? Himself, his beauty, his interest. And every single time I disobey, I tell God, I don't need you. Myself knows what it's doing. Jesus warns of the danger of the self. And so in order to deny self, I first need to see, like Jesus showed Peter, I need to see where I'm at. I need to see where I am. Re-examine self. But then, secondly, Jesus says to them, Deny yourself. The word deny that he used is actually better translated in a different word. Which also helps us to understand what he means and how to do it. Jesus said, um, it's not quite that you're saying no to yourself. You're not just saying no, no, no. Because quite honestly, it's like that's like saying pink elephant. Don't say pink elephant. Don't say pink elephant. Don't think, don't think about pink elephant. Don't think about pink elephant. You will think about pink elephant. It's not just denying yourself because the self somehow wants to be attended to. The fallen nature of man always has self 
focusing on itself and yourself in that situation becomes more important than your interests become more important. So Jesus doesn't say deny that part of you. It's not, it's not, it's not say no, say no, say no, say no. He actually used the word that means disown. 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 It means, it, it, it comes from a poem, at Amorii, or I don't even know how to pronounce it, but, but it means utterly disown. You, you, you abstain, in other words, I'm not going to deal with it because I don't own it anymore. It's not me anymore. I don't own it and that self is another part of me that I have to put over there and talk to. Like I'm talking to another person. Paul talks about the old man and the new man. Y'all still with me? So the old man has to be the old self that's over there. And Paul says the new man is in Christ, not the old man. You gotta disown, you have to think to yourself, I no longer own myself. If you're going to deny yourself and take up your part, you need to tell yourself that you no longer are in charge of yourself. So when yourself starts to rise up, literally talk to the self and say, self, you're not in charge anymore. You have no basis on which to claim your rights over my actions and behaviors anymore. You don't own me anymore. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know, Paul said, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who owns the temple? God owns the temple. Who is in you, he said, the Holy Spirit. God is in you, whom you received, the Holy Spirit whom you received from God. You are not your own. You have been bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. The old self was owned by you and the devil. The new self is owned by God, and he lives in you like he lived in the temple. Galatians 2.20, my old self, Paul said, has been crucified with Christ. It is not, that it, 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 Paul went as far as to say, it, it's no longer I who actually live. But it's Christ who's living in me. Somewhere else, Paul would say, you might have considered the old self dead. It's not me anymore. I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Denying myself means I gotta look at who I am and be honest with myself and then say, self, guess what? You don't want to show anymore. I have to talk to myself. Romans 6, dead to sin, alive in Christ. You have to preach the gospel to yourself on a day-to-day basis. Taking up your cross means you preach the gospel to yourself. You evangelize yourself. You treat yourself, you treat self like self is self make me sick. <laughs> self get on my nerve. You know God hates sin. You can hate that self. Don't hate yourself. Uh, psychology today has it wrong. They say love yourself. No, 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 no. Oh, no, 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 no. no, love the God in you, but hate the self that the devil's in control of out there. The self will get you in so much trouble. To, Paul said, listen, what should we say then? The, the, shall we go on saying that make grace man increase? No, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Your sin is in the self part of you that you don't own. It's not running the show. It don't have no control over you. You don't have no allegiance to it. You don't owe it anything. It is not obligated to it, Paul said. You ain't got to have nothing to do with it. Put it over there. You have to count it, Paul said at the end of this passage. So listen, he said, listen, uh, don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ died and was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. It's not about picking up a a bunch of difficulty. We don't carry a cross. We have the cross crucifying the self in us. Paul says when Christ died, your self died. And that self no longer has any power over you anymore. And you, you may feel it. That's why Jesus said every day you got to pick up that cross. It's like you got to show yourself. 
the cross and say, self, look at that cross. That cross means you do not control me anymore. You gotta walk down the street, talking to yourself, preaching the gospel to yourself. Go ahead and do it before you get to work. When you're in the situation, right then in the situation, well, I gotta know, I gotta get in the habit of saying, okay, self, let me walk myself through this. I'm no longer owned by you anymore. I'm saved, I'm bought with a price. What you're also doing is you're preaching the scriptures to yourself, giving your, yourself truth and power to what God said. This is not about behavior, it's actually about identity. Pastor, can you, um, could you come here for a second? I, I just need to use Pastor. Get Pastor here, get Pastor here. <laughs> listen, listen. Now, Brother Tommy is here. Where's Brother Tommy? He might have went downstairs. Oh, yeah. Brother Tommy gave me this bag of a coat. It's called bag. He gave me two coats. He gave me a green one, green trench coat, he gave me this black one. This is real leather. This ain't no black leather. <laughs> It's real, though. This kind of cold, when you get it, you'd be like, man, I need a new suit. <laughs> I got to get it with the coat. It's a bad, it's a bad car. I put it on. <laughs> Our pastor is a, is a fashionable guy. He is, he, 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 he is, he is, he, he looks, he, he, he. <laughs> you got to get a new suit. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I want the brother time to be in here for this because I want to mess with him a little bit. But, but y'all know brother time. That's my boy. That's our boy, right? Now, for those who may not know brother Tommy, brother Tommy, I'll just say this: brother Tommy about sharp as a tack, sharp as a tiznag, and tack. He's telling you, listen, brother Tommy got shoes I ain't even I never even seen in the store. He had stuff off the internet they ain't handle internet. Because back in the day, come on forward, brother. Come on, come on forward. Because back in the day, Brother Tommy would be stolen, sharp as a tack. Now, Brother Tommy also then told me some stories. Now, I just feel by, you know, the Holy Ghost power, the spirit that's within me, that when Brother Tommy was wearing his coat, I think some of that activity might have been DC. You understand what I'm telling you? I don't know, is it, but, but see, because, because the other thing is, when you, when, you, when you put that kind of hat on, what you really got to do is you got to, you got to, what you got to do is this right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't just wear the coat. You know what I'm saying? And you don't just put the, you don't just put the hat on. See, your mama ain't never even seen you like this. You look like, what's going on? Yeah, just cop to the side, just like that. Let's give it a little, give it a little. Give it a little. Give it a little. Give it a little. Give it a Now I'm messing with Pastor too. This don't even look like Pastor. No, it sure does. It don't fit Pastor. <laughs> Not because it's out of his right size. But, you know, and I, and I hesitate to say this, but you ain't gonna see Pastor Penn in there on screen. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on the internet, put it, put it out here, and be like, for his, uh, for his 60th birthday, he got a new style. That's what I want to do. The pastor would be like, oh my, well, Lord, have mercy. What happened? Bring him in for a meeting. But, but listen, that's just like sin. That's just like sin. It don't fit. It's out of character. It's out of nature. We think sin is in the nature. It's really out of nature. Because when God created us, sin was out of our nature. We put on sin like we put on this bad coat and be strolling and pimping and all that. But that's out of character. That's out, really, that's out of your nature. Your real nature is oneness and unity and peace with God. Jesus came to bring us, to redeem us, to bring us back to our true nature. Our dignified, sin sinless, spotless, blemishless self. 
You've been set free. So when you think about yourself, when you go back into that area that you're making more important than God, you're actually going back into an area where you're dipping back in the clothes. I was going to bring, I didn't have one. I was going to bring, a, like I said, some people don't even know what I'm talking about right now. I was going to bring a, 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 a tie one sweatsuit. Because back then, my wife over there, it's a sweatsuit that had big letters written on the inside. And, 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 and tie one written on the back. You don't even know what I'm talking about right now. It's a sweatshirt. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a nylon, not nylon, but what's it called? A polyester or some cotton blend. And it had big writing on it. Had all these colors on it. I'm talking about it looked fresh back in like '87. <laughs> but now, if I walk down the street wearing, well, to tell you the truth, they bring stuff back now. It's unbelievable. They probably probably going to see somebody somewhere. But it doesn't fit anymore. The old man does not fit. The old woman does not fit. You put it on, the Holy Spirit makes you uncomfortable because that nature that you are stepping back into, you're allowing to control, does not let you be comfortable. And y'all know just as good as I do, if you get yourself out there, then you start to fit. The Holy Spirit will beat you up and start working on you. The old nature does not fit. So you take up, you deny yourself and take up your cross by reminding yourself, self, I have a new identity in Christ. It's not about clothes, it's not about the external, but I do not fit this anymore. So if you ever get into a situation and you have a year and God gives you a way out, just like he said he always would do, you remind yourself, Yo, this don't fit me right now. This is not me anymore. There's a, there's a, there's a myth that goes around, that's been going around on the internet about, um, uh, about uh, um, Augustine. And, and they said that Augustine was a, um, was, had a problem with sexual sin. And after he became a Christian, and after he got saved and started cha and changed his life, and after God had an impact on him, he saw this woman who was a prostitute who he uh, knew from before his old life. And the story goes, although it's been kind of discredited, it's not a true story or whatever, but the story goes that the, the woman said to him, hey, Augustine, it's me, it is I. Like she wanted to bring him back into his old self. Yeah. And he looked at it and said, well, <laughs> It is you, but it's not I. Right. <laughs> now, whether that story is true or not, that works for me. Yes. Yes. What you need to tell yourself yes. is it's not me anymore. And then finally, you deny yourself by checking yourself out and examining and re-examining yourself and being honest with yourself. The only way to know where you are. And secondly, you deny yourself by, and, 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 and you take up your cross by disowning the self. Yes. And thirdly, and quite simply, this is the part where I had to say, okay, Lord, I can do that. I can remind myself who I am on a day-to-day -day basis if I need to. Jesus said at the end, follow me. Follow me. If you're going to be worthy of me, if you're going to be one of my disciples, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. What I discovered, what I think many of us have discovered, is that I can keep on reminding myself who I am. I can keep on denying the self in me that wants to get pulled back into what does not fit me. Yes. But it takes a toll on the soul. It, it, it could actually be defeating. That's why a lot of people walk away, because they, they've been walking and walking and walking, and it seems like, well, Lord, I'm not changing, or there's an area that's not changing. Something must be wrong. Because this requires a daily, yes. sometimes an hourly reminder. Yes. I don't have to get saved over again. I don't have to ever do it. It's a one-time thing. Amen. 
But I gotta remind myself of the cross all the time. Amen. And so then I said, Well, Jesus, why didn't you just end it at take up your cross and follow me? He said, uh, take up your cross. He said, You have to follow me. And I thought about it. And what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to follow? What did the hearers, the crowd, the people in the crowd, and what did Peter hear when he heard Jesus say, You gotta follow me? And it wasn't the first time or the last time that he would say that to people. You gotta follow me. You gotta follow me. Does it mean, as it means to many, many of us, that we gotta be like Jesus? I gotta ask myself, what would Jesus do and then do that? Yes. Only to discover I might do that today, but then tomorrow I'm gonna do something else? I'm gonna do, do what Jesus didn't do? The reality is, Jesus says, follow me, because what happens when you follow Jesus? Rather, where do you follow him to? Where were they following Jesus to? Were they following Jesus to the, to the, to the road along Jerusalem where all the people played, put, the, put the palm branches down and they said Hosanna? Were they following him there? Sure. Were they, were they, were they following him uh, uh, up into the upper room where they, he said, listen, this is my body broken for you, broken for the life of the world, and he bent down and he, he washed their feet. Did, 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 does it mean to follow him there? Absolutely. Those are examples and we should, we should emulate them. We should do our best to emulate those. Do we follow him there? Absolutely. Do we follow him into the garden where he struggled and wrestled for the second or third time in his life, sweating so much that it looked like blood was coming from his, his, his body, and he was wrestling and saying, God, not my will, but your will be done? Do you follow him there? Absolutely. You see him in the garden struggling and you think to yourself, if he can do all of that, then I can do it too. Do you follow him there? Absolutely. You follow him there. You follow him on the road into the trial in the middle of the night where he accused him of things he did not do. You follow him there in the dark and in the cold. Yeah, you follow him there. But when you actually keep following Jesus, where do you wind up? You wind up at the cross. Right at the foot of the cross. You can deny yourself and take up your cross every single day of your life. And you will come to find out that you will be a failure. I will be, I eventually will do something, say something, uh, idolize something, go back into something that completely denies who I am. You gotta find yourself at the foot of the cross. Everybody stands on a level playing field at the foot of the cross. Because at the foot of the cross, you see Jesus with his arms stretched out. You see him with blood in his, in his hands and in his feet. You see him with a crown of thorns on his head. You see him in between two things. And you actually understand that Jesus took all the shame and he took all the hatred and he took all the pain that we deserve because we could not follow him perfectly. You get to the cross and you say, my God, if you did all of that for me, if you do all that for me, you look at yourself and you say, self, yes. I have to leave you. Yes. I can't follow you, self, anymore because that is too glorious and too wonderful and I appreciate it too much. You preach the gospel to yourself and then you live the cross. Yes. Apply the cross every single day. After this, knowing that everything had been accomplished and to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A drawer of water was sitting there. So they soaked a sponge in the wine and put it on a stalk of hyssop and they lifted it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Jesus once and for all, on the cross of Calvary, did something for us that we could never do for ourselves. And if you could just live in that moment, what was it like for those disciples from a distance to be looking at this man crucified for them? Knowing who they were, what they were doing, how they were, knowing that they betrayed him, 
what was, how it, how it empowered them, what did it do? It changed them. These men eventually went, and what did they do? They eventually would give their life. Because they followed him to the, follow him. Follow him. If you don't hear nothing else, just keep on coming. If every single day you feel like you want to step back, you keep on coming. If you know somebody and you want to go with them and you are you know, pulled into something, well, you follow him. If yourself is over here and it's pulling you into something, you follow him. Listen to him saying to you, follow me, follow me. He didn't say it one time, he says it every day. He says that every time something happens, he says that every time you fail, I'm trying to preach the gospel to myself. He says that every time you mess up, he says that every time you do that habit, he says that every time you get pulled into that sin that you can't control, follow me. Follow me, what grace, oh what love has the Father lavished on us that we might be called children of God. That he never said to me, he's never going to be my child again because you keep on doing the same old thing. You can always follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me, follow me. Every time, baby, keep on coming. That's all right. If you got to do it ten times, come on back and follow me. I got infinite grace. I got infinite mercy. My forgiveness lasts forever. Come on and follow me. I don't care what you've been doing, how you've been doing it, where you've been, how dirty you've been. Follow me. It's an honor to be me and to know who I am and to know I don't deny myself and I don't pick up my cross. But Jesus said to me, follow me. You can follow me. You can follow me. I want you to follow me. You are my son. You're my child. You're my daughter. I love you more than you can ever imagine. I want you. To, I, I, I bestow on you the honor, though you're not worthy of following me. Follow me. It's all about what you are doing to go somewhere. Yes. Christians, forget about leadership. Follow me. Because yes. if you follow me, Jesus said, I'll never let you down. I'll never cast you away. Yes. You're my sheep. My sheep always hear my voice. A stranger, they will not follow. It doesn't matter what happens to you or what you do. It doesn't matter. You can follow me. You know somebody in your life. Yes. Who has went back and they never thought that they could be who God called them to be. Yes. You tell them. Forget that. Forget that. You follow him. Yes. You follow, keep following him to the foot of the cross and he will fix it. Yes, he will make you right. He will. Let's stand. Hallelujah. I was wrestling and struggling and back and forth and dipping and diving and doing everything. And one of my excuses was, you know, well, what about um, all the people who, like, you know, never heard about Jesus? Does Jesus, you know, like, send them to hell? You know, what's up with that? And my friend said very simply to me, he actually did not, he didn't even mean to say it. He said, listen, you keep worrying about people's souls all the way over in the middle of the world somewhere, in some third world country. You need to worry about your own soul. And that thing hit me. Jesus says, you can follow me. Come to me. No matter where you think you are, come to me. I want to have I know off the call, I don't even really like off the call attention. Because you just, I mean, you can just come down here and go up and go home and be the same, do the same thing you want to do. But I want to actually have an altar call. I want to call people who want to put a stamp on this day. We need to just come here to celebrate somebody's birthday. I want somebody to come down where you feel like God is calling you. No matter, what you, no matter how long you've been here, no matter what you've been doing, no matter how you've been serving, no matter what, you, if you end up you have to be embarrassed, we're all the same in here, it don't matter, yes, remember, it don't matter. If you have something in your life that you want, God, that you know God is speaking to you about, let's pray about it right here. Right here. 
today. Make this day a marker and say, God, I'm not just going to deny myself out of my own willpower from now on. I'm going to give myself that part of me that I've been holding back to you. And I'm going to let you do with me something that you want to do. I'm going to follow you. If you don't know if the only way you know about Christianity is you grew up around it, like I did, and it took 15 years for you to actually get a personal relationship after getting introduced to the truth. If that's you, and you really know, but you know beyond a shadow of a doubt there's some stuff that God wants to work out in you that ain't going nowhere through churchy Andy. Let's get down to the altar right here, right now. There's some stuff in your life that is a recurring habit. You have not been able to get over it. You call it a, a habitual issue. It's a thing that's there you keep on doing. You want it gone. God said, we can do that today. I want you to follow me, give it to me. You can let it go. And I'll practice in you every day. And after that practice, you will be different for the rest of your life. If that's you, come on down. I'm preaching the gospel to Christians. I'm preaching the gospel to people who know him. If you know in your life there's another level where he's calling you to, and you don't want to give it up, and you want and he's calling you to do something, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know. Just like me on the end of that aisle. Somebody's trying to push you out into the end of the aisle right now. And that's me saying, come on down, right here, follow me. I got you. I love you. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the law, the Spirit has set you free from the law of sin and death. And I'm here to tell you, it feels so good. It never felt so good to be so bad. To know that God stretched out his arms just for me. Oh, it never felt so good. I can let it all
So David's understanding of it was to say, Lord, create in me a new heart. Yes. Give me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. See, David understood that the self, the old man, wasn't going to work. David didn't even want to work with his old self. He says, give me a new heart. I want you to pray with those who are at the altar as we pray together because they are saying, God, help me to deny myself so that I can follow you. This life is, 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 is really not that difficult because you don't have to understand it all the way. All you have to do is to say yes to the Lord. And he will start making things new for you. He will start doing such wonderful things in your life that, that you will you won't be able to understand and explain it. But someday you may have it as a testimony. Someday, Brother Delano will stand and talk about the testimony of what God did for them. And we all can do it. So bow, let's bow our heads as we pray for those who are standing here, as we as we pray with them, because God is working in all these lives. And those who are standing at the altar today, as, as, as Brother Delano said, this is a word to the same, right? Preaching evangelism to the Christian. We're not trying to save somebody who who is not. I mean, if, if the Holy Spirit works that way, we accept you. But 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 Christians need to hear that we have to deny ourselves. Christians have to stop allowing self to rule. We used to sing a song, let self be slain and let Jesus reign. And so the two have to work that way. The more, you know, they, they, they work in tangent with each other. So the more you deny yourself, the more you, closer you get to the Lord. Or the closer you get to the Lord, the more you deny yourself. Isn't that awesome? James said, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for your Holy Spirit's power. We thank you, Lord, for grace that, that we we can just say we accept it because we can't truly understand grace. It is so wonderful and marvelous that, that you keep applying it to us and it's sufficient to heal us, it's sufficient to save us, it's sufficient to redeem us, it's sufficient to keep us. And, and it's so unmerited, there's nothing that we have done or can do to deserve your grace. So Lord, we thank you for grace. We praise you today that, that you abundantly give us grace. So Lord, we thank you. We simply thank you, Lord, for being you and for being real. And for those who are standing at the altar, who have got this glimpse of the, of the necessity to, to grow closer to you by distancing themselves by distancing, distancing themselves from their selves. We all need to, to put off ourselves. We all, all need to, to deal with that self, that, that part that is sinful, that we were born with, but we were also born when you, when you birthed us, when you created us. You breathed yourself in us. So, so that sin nature that, that constantly wants to rule has no authority because we also have you in us. So quicken us, Lord. Awaken yourself in us so that we can allow the God self to overcome the man self so that we are now free. And who the Son has set free is truly free. And only the Son can set us free from sin. Thank you for dying on the Calvary's cross. 
Thank you for rescuing us from the lost. And now thank you for walking with us and keeping us as we go from day to day. We pray for Sister Marcia that you will continue to bless her and strengthen her. That she will grow in you. We pray for Brother Julian. Lord, as he transitions to the end of his, uh, of the beginning of his career, that you will help him to choose the right path and to ever stay with you. We thank you, O oh Lord, for Joshua. The salvation, Lord, that you've given to us and to this world. We pray that in him he will learn to, to deny himself even more and, and to be that reckless, abandoned youth that will push someone into the aisle so that they can follow you. Help him to push other people into your path so that they will find you. So that they can, he can be a savior for others. Not that he saved them, but he pushed them right in the path of the savior. Thank you for that testimony, Lord. Thank you for the analogy of how you can use one person to bring another one to your knowledge of who you are. So we are all evangelists. We are all working for the King. Thank you, O Lord, for this day. Thank you for your word that you promise it will never return to your voice. So we know that word that we've just heard is now working in us. And may it come to fruition. In your name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. And amen.